Um, I'm really pleased to be here and um, thank you for coming out everybody uh, and I'm honoured to be sharing the virtual stage with Annie, Peter and Stephen. Um, so tonight I'm going to be reading from a collection of short stories which uh, there's three short stories, um, they're quite long, uh, I'm going to read an extract from two of them, um, one longer to start off with and then because that's pretty dark I'm going to read a shorter, lighter extract to, uh, to finish off with. Um, so the first, these are stories set in the Yorkshire Pennines and uh, modern, the world of modern farming, as Aaron has said. The first is kind of accidentally timely. Uh, so in winter 2019, I started writing about Instagram farmers. I got very into that. Uh, I don't know if any of you are into Instagram farmers, but there is a recent trend for real life farmers to document their lives um, and basically go viral, get massive followings by sharing pictures of lambs and nice views and animals doing the funniest things and their kids and that sort of thing. Um, so I came across one farmer's account of how she gave birth to her daughter during spring lambing season in 2001, which was the time of the foot and mouth epidemic in the UK. Um, footpaths and road travel were banned in affected areas, which was nearly everywhere in the countryside in the UK. Um, and this woman was in hospital giving birth, but she was separated from her sheep, her flock and her livelihood, which were threatened by the disease and potentially would have all been killed by the army to stop the spread of the disease, which is what what they did in, in real life. And a lot of people lost their livelihoods because of it. Um, I was thinking about control and the way that farmers are constantly fighting to control things that they have no power over, like the weather, for example, and animal fertility and food prices, and how that forms the mentality that of, of your life in the countryside. So I wrote a story about that. And then in, just as I kind of finished that story and was uh, starting to submit it some places, uh, there was a pandemic and suddenly the story changed and felt a lot closer. So, um, here, here it is. Raven Seat, North Yorkshire, 2001. I wake up because he is not snoring. I turn my head. Still dark outside, the moon resting on the moor like a fingernail clipping. His head is on the pillow beside me and I can see the gleam of his eyeballs. When his voice rasps, it is a shock. What if we get it, he says. I blink and mumble. We won't, I say. It won't get as far as us, don't worry. I'm not worried about us, he says, and he spits the us. I'm thinking about those fucking tourists down in Catterick, fucking offcomers. He is talking about the farmer he pays to shelter our sheep in the valley over winter. It is spring now, lambing time, and time for our 800 purebred Swaledale ewes to come back to the uplands with us. But we've just heard that all movement of animals is banned until the foot and mouth is over. His tone sends a chill down my spine. Farmers don't talk about other farmers in that way. They're not just colleagues. They are allies in the same fight. No matter how much he might scorn or whinge about his neighbours, he does it with a grudging respect. This sounds different. They best take care of them, he says, and I know that note of warning and I feel it in the pit of my stomach. Bad things lie ahead in the Catterick farmer's future. Then he rolls onto his side, his back rising up before me, and I can no longer see his open eyes. I close my own eyes and try not to think of the pigs in the Essex abattoir, hanging dead and cold with blisters on their lipless mouths. The first cases in England. They say it's spreading north. I wonder how it is that I can't just reach out and touch him. Hey, are you awake? And yet, I am as unable to do that as if I were paralysed or frozen, or something was holding my arms behind my back and pinning me down. I open my eyes again. The moon looks like a thin, curved smile. Sky's all pearly outside next morning when I get up at six. Place my feet carefully as I go down the bare wood of the stairs so as not to slip and make any noise over his radio. The house is more lived in than it was last year when I moved in, but it's still what some people, people who don't get us, 
might call empty. But it's like he says, we don't need flowery things when all we do here is grab a bite of food and sleep. Well, OK, I took up the carpet with a pair of shears when I decided I was here for good. And he let me strip the yellowy smoke stained wallpaper, but no more. I am still thinking about how it was as I crossed the stone flags of the kitchen and reached the back door. I pull on overalls, my own breath curling out before me as I fumble my boots on. It smells of dog shite. Outside, there is a streak of hot pink at the horizon. Shepherd's warning, I think, and mine to check the horoscope later, crossing my fingers in the meantime to ward off bad luck. Himself and the dogs are already down by the cattle grid. They are barking and the quad bike is revving and he is shouting at the both of them, come by, Floss, Sky, come by. And then he yelled back up to me, come on then. He revs the quad bike, not looking back. What am I waiting for? He is going out onto the moor when we have only the scant hundred older sheep we kept with us and no lambs. I pull my hood up and follow him onto the moor where only curlews rise and sing. When I was training as a florist back when I lived with my dad, my boss told me about shipments of exotic flowers carrying stowaways. Tarantulas, poisonous red ants, black widows, she'd said, walking her dirty fingernails over the counter. They invade the ecosystem and they have no predators. I imagined it, unrolling brown paper on your kitchen table all a crackle, when out of the stems squirms some fat boneless black thing that has scuttled off before you can move a muscle. And later your trousers down on the bog or sweating over your onions when you feel a cold snip at your ankle, and that's it for you. I told him about the spiders and flowers and he snorted. That's how diseases spread, I said. Maybe there are sheep ticks or flies or something. We were sitting on the sofa. He was shoveling in his baked beans and I was screwed up in a corner, tooting the chocolate off the sides of a blue ribbon and trying not to shiver. Fuck that, he said. Be easy enough if it was a matter of catching a couple of spiders. You what? I said. Have you ever tried to catch a spider? He didn't even bother to look up from break scraping the baked bean tin. They're bloody great things, he said. This is a virus. It's carried on the wind. His brow started going all creased as he stared down into the tin. Then he shook his head abruptly and cleared his throat. 1967, he said. It got blown northwards by the wind. And in 1980, it got blown onto the Isle of Wight from France. It's a windborne virus, but it can be carried on cars, clothes, shoes, those bloody hikers, offlanders. They don't belong here. That's why they've locked up the coast to coast path down so fast this time. He stopped, tipped his head back and shook the last dregs of juice from the tin. I watched his Adam's apple bobbing up and down, one small orange drip, drip trickling down his beard. He put the can down, sighed and rubbed his jaw, apparently without noticing. Windborne? Wasn't that what people thought in like medieval times? I thought he had to be kidding. I felt suddenly starving for baked beans, put down my gnawed chocolate bar and got up, glancing at the grey hairs in his beard. Windborne? He was obviously desperate. He'd left school years ago. He needed to have some kind of explanation, I thought. He was older than me, after all. But that was in late March, and as we watched the news each night, I began to feel a creeping suspicion. It was like an invisible giant was stamping north, county by county. Devon, Wales, one quick stride up into Lancashire, coming for us. We watched its footsteps tracking up the country, and my old world, Tesco and school friends having babies, Afghanistan on TV and catching the bus to town, they just bled away. And when I realised that's what it was, coming for us, I felt relief deep down in my gut. I've come to realise that that's what you feel when the worst happens. Relief. You should have known. You were right. The plague would descend one day and on you of all people. You knew what you always feared would come to be. So that is my 
pandemic story, the accidental pandemic. Um, and I, I remember foot and mouth. Um, you used to have to dip your feet into these sort of buckets of yellow liquid and you couldn't go walking around fields. Um, so this pamphlet is inspired by my own experiences of growing up in partly in the countryside uh, being a, and being a teenager in a fairly bleak part of North Yorkshire. My dad has a very small farm and his dad farmed and I'm interested in the way that people who live on the land relate to the land and how their behaviour is shaped by the land, um, particularly with regards to control and power. There isn't much that is more toxic masculinity than literally one man spraying a field with toxins. So, um, but I also think that it's really interesting that weakness is a big part of being the farmer. You're very aware constantly of how puny you are as a human um, and how close you are to being an animal yourself. So the next extract is from a story where the animals can communicate better than the people in a marriage. He recklessly says he'll buy her anything she wants from town, throws around all sorts of vows and promises. She laughs and says all she asks is that he visit his new mother-in-law, her mother, once in a while. There's a pause and then she asks if she'll be going to meet his parents soon on the neighbouring farm. Another pause and he nods, staring at his orange pint and her through the glass, mermaid curves. Aye, in a while, he says. In a while. For now, he doesn't want her and her, his mother nattering on. Who knows what they'd say to each other? He doesn't want them comparing notes on him. Or worse, what if they didn't talk? Or if they talked, but about the wrong things? She'll have to learn how things are around here on the farm. When they're married. He takes her around the fields. See the lambs, he says, when showing her round, helping her over the gate. You can have one if you like, for your own. She pulls her cardigan round her wrists. Just like a real farmer's wife, she says, smiling tightly. He mentally chinks a pint with himself. He was right. A pet lamb is exactly the kind of whimsy she'd think belonged on a farm. He can picture his father and mother with their eyes narrowing and lips thinning at the thought, but he's sure she will settle down. He can feel something buoyant building up inside his stomach the longer she's around. This is happiness, he thinks. Well, it's a bit strange at first. Her potions and lo lotions clutter at the bathroom. Her pictures and postcards dot his plain walls. She has fanciful habits, hangs her colourful clothes over doors, lintels, picture hooks. <laughs> it's like living in a circus tent, he says. She finds his grandparents' silver wedding service boxed away and she starts using it at all the meals or places pieces in odd corners. His father's christening tankard, catching the light with a bundle of cherry trigs in it. Going my seam lass, he says, shaking his head. What? she says, and he can't help laughing. She's even forgotten the way they speak here, if she ever knew at all. She takes baths for hours, so he has to hammer on the door and bellow until she appears, wrapped in a towel, blinking water away in surprise. She goes on long, useless walks and then orders clothes and even food to the door by post. Cheese! When well, they have plenty of food. And Rhonda Wood on the neighbouring farm is famous for her cheese. I can't ask her, she says. I've never spoken to her. This is such a pointless statement that he doesn't know what to say. This far from town, they don't need to speak to Rhonda and Farmer Wood. They know the woods like they know the weather. But overall, despite the constant presence of delivery vans, he is happier than he has ever been. This is love, he thinks. In the morning... He leaps out of bed to swirl mouthwash round his gums before going back to kiss her awake. He cannot stop watching her, coming over to touch her as, he combs, as she combs her glittering red hair in the mirror, as she darts about the kitchen in one of his fu her funny dressing gown dresses. He can't help reaching out to touch, to stroke, as she sits, holding the screen of her phone or talking into it to her mother, as she does for hours. She closets herself in the sitting room for hours on end to make her phone calls. Female things, he supposes. 
He loves to see the shape of her mouth, her little beating white throat. He wishes he could take that voice out to the fields for the long days and turn over the sound of her in his tattered pocket like a key or a trinket to bounce from palm to palm. Okay, I'm going to leave that there. Um, thank you so much for having me and thank you especially to Aaron and Charlie and everyone at Broken Sleep Books um, for taking a chance on these.